This is Optimal Living Daily, episode 1618, on Transforming the Judgmental Mind, Stories from Seven Days of Silence, part one, by Dr. Ilana Miller of zenpsychiatry.com, and I'm Justin Mollick. Happy Saturday, welcome to one of the only podcasts in the world where blogs are narrated to you for free with permission from the authors. It's an award-winning podcast, thanks to you. And today I have a bit of a longer post, so I'll read the first half today and then finish the rest for you tomorrow. So with that, let's get right to it and start optimizing your life. On Transforming the Judgmental Mind, Stories from Seven Days of Silence, Part 1, by Dr. Ilana Miller of zenpsychiatry.com. On the first evening of my recent seven-day silent meditation retreat, I had a strange dream. I was in my house, and it had flooded. As I walked through the rooms, I waded in several feet of water. Panicked, I raced to call my landlord to help me. I could feel the anxiety and fear as I rushed to dial her number, mistyping it several times. Instead of picking up the phone, though, she had her husband answer. He was unkind and dismissive and told me that his wife didn't want to talk to me. I could feel her presence in the background and became more and more upset as she refused to get on the phone, refused to help me, refused to even talk to me. The next morning, I woke up and still felt the weight of my anguish in the dream. I wondered why that dream came to me when it did and what it was trying to tell me. In dreams, other people often symbolize parts of ourselves. In real life, my landlord is a very sweet and non-dismissive woman, and so I felt that her presence symbolized a part of myself that is dismissive and cruel to my own anguish and pain. Over the course of the week, many powerful emotions and experiences bubbled to the surface, and I took advantage of the safety and simplicity of the retreat environment to stop ignoring them. But first things first, Was it hard to be silent for seven days? No, it was easy, and it was a very, very cool experience. The rules of the retreat were no talking and no eye contact, because eye contact can be a form of communication, and the idea is that any communication pulls a person out of their inner world and takes away from the deepening of the meditative experience. But did the silence feel isolating? Absolutely not. First, the environment was so safe and warm that you could feel the mutual caring and compassion emanating from each person, even without talking to them. I came to the retreat with a few friends from my meditation classes at UCLA, and while I did not talk to them or look at them for the entire period we spent in silence, I felt their care for me and know they felt my care for them. One time I saw my friend sitting in the dining hall at lunch and took the seat next to her. We did not speak a single word or even acknowledge each other's presence, but by sitting there, I let her know that she was in my thoughts. Another day, she took the seat next to me at dinner and I felt her silent greeting. We were each assigned jobs as a way to practice mindful working and to give back to the community. I was a second shift dishwasher. There were three of us, each with separate responsibilities. I scrubbed the dishes, the guy to my left rinsed them and put them in the dishwasher, and the other woman took them out of the dishwasher and put them away. The guy next to me who put the dishes in the dishwasher We barely spoke to each other or even made eye contact, but I swear to you that we were friends. On one occasion, I thought we were wrapping up but had missed a bucket of dishes. He gently tapped me on the shoulder and pointed to the bucket. I reflexively gasped, oh, he laughed and I laughed and then we went on washing dishes. Another time, he was late to the shift so I had to get started without him. When he arrived, I saw him press his palms together and bow to me out of the corner of my eye. I bowed back and all was immediately forgiven. At the end of the retreat, once the silence was broken, I found him and we started chatting, mostly about how awesome we were at washing dishes. It did not feel like this was the first time we were meeting. It felt like we were already friends. A meditation retreat is not about finding peace, but insight. I think one of the problems with the mindfulness craze hitting us these days is its failure to accurately represent what meditation does. People start meditating hoping to find relaxation and instead are struck like a ton of bricks by the insanity of their own minds. An inner peace does come with a regular meditation practice, but it comes later, not from forcing oneself into a calm state, but from reaching a deeper insight about the realities of the human experience so one can stop reacting unskillfully to the joys and sorrows intrinsic to our existence. I came to the retreat hoping to relax and slow down, and I did, but I also learned important lessons about how the mind works and how I create suffering for myself. 
It's easy to find peace in the middle of a meditation retreat with no responsibilities, no phone calls, no emails, and no demands, right? What's more challenging and more important is to find peace in regular, everyday moments instead of clinging to brief pleasures and resisting inevitable pains. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is not. The Buddha taught that we are all as if struck through the heart by an arrow. This arrow symbolizes the unavoidable pains we experience through the sheer fact that we are human. However, we carry a second arrow as well, and the mistake we make is thinking that by shooting the second arrow at ourselves or someone else, we can remove the pain of the first. Have you ever had physical pain and clenched around it? Or had heartbreak and told yourself that you must not be good enough? Or felt criticized and hurt and lashed out at someone else? One of the goals of a meditation practice is to learn how to sit with the first arrow without shooting the second. We learn how to sit with the unavoidable pains of the human experience without adding suffering to the mix. The first step in transforming the judgmental mind? Study it. The specific topic of this particular retreat was how to transform judgmental states of mind. The teacher defined judgments as noticing plus reactivity. The goal was to become aware of how our judgmental minds worked so we could use our ability to discern for wise and compassionate purposes as opposed to getting caught up in our narratives about how things should be. Quote, what gets measured gets managed. Peter Drucker. Quote, to know the velocity of a particle, we must measure it, and to measure it, we are forced to affect it. Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. First, we study the judgmental mind. We watch it, understand it, measure it, mindfully follow its stories. Just the sheer process of observing can create insight into our patterns thereby dissolving the ignorance that leads to habitual reactivity. Over the week, we were instructed to become keenly aware of our judgments, both during meditation and throughout the day. Did we judge ourselves for not meditating well enough? Did we judge someone else for not moving through the food line fast enough? Did we judge our knees for getting tired from so much sitting? What did the judgments feel like in the body? What sensations arose? How did the judgments feel in the heart? As I reflected on recent situations where I had become critical or judgmental, I noticed that my reactivity tended to stem from feelings of being threatened or unsafe in some way. In seeking to protect myself from these difficult feelings, I had shot the second arrow into someone else. To be continued. You just listened to part one of the post titled On Transforming the Judgmental Mind, Stories from Seven Days of Silence by Dr. Ilana Miller of zenpsychiatry.com. And thank you to Dr. Ilana. I've done many, many hours of meditation, but never done a silent retreat. I know it was offered at some of the places I've been to, and everyone I know who has done it has said it was a worthwhile experience, but I never got around to it. I've heard stories from the super emotional to not that much, but in either case, always interesting to hear about and definitely made me want to try it. Chris Reining, a writer we narrate mostly on Optimal Finance Daily, he actually did it and had a very emotional response. That might be worth checking out if you're interested in a silent meditation retreat. I narrated that article way back in episode 939. But that should do it for today. Thank you for being here and listening every day, including the weekends. And I'll be back tomorrow to finish up this post where your optimal life awaits.